thank you so much for finding this room. Uh, that's probably a good start. Um, yeah, my name is Basil Schinken. I'm VP of Engineering at AppLoving, and I wanted to share some thoughts and share some prophecies about the future of data storage. Where would data be stored in the future? Now, uh, it's actually a little more boring. Uh, so what I'm going to be looking at is not the far future of quantum computing or um, you know, DNA-based biocomputers. What I'm going to be looking at is future that's practical and that I believe that we're living through right now and that you can go out and purchase and you know, use on your servers. So that's the kind of future that uh, I think I wanted to cover today. So this, is, this, this talk is, first, I'm going to try to keep it relatively short so that we can get lunch. Uh, second, this talk is going to have two big parts. So the first part is going to be the claim. So uh, when I started my job at AppLoving, what did I think about how, to, how data is stored and where should it be processed and all that? Uh, and how has it changed through the years and how we believe is going to shape out and be in the future? So that's the first part. The second part of the talk is going to be some know-how. So we're going to go over a bunch of products and a bunch of techniques and a bunch of approaches we use you know, at our company as an example of that very, very strong movement towards sort of in-memory, super fast, random data processing. So, and then you know, I'm going to try to leave you with some questions that I keep asking myself uh, that help me sort of plan for uh, future projects and future architectures. So with that, oh yes, and there's going to be a mildly funny meme somewhere in the beginning, somewhere in the middle of this. It's not going to be very funny, but you know, every presentation has to have a meme, so uh, watch out for that. Um, all right, so a couple things about AppLoving. So AppLoving is a mobile advertising company. So mobile advertising is very, very simple thing. So basically, you get a request, and you have to return an ad. And that's pretty much all we do. And that's very simple, except for a few caveats. First. There's tons of requests. Second, to serve an ad, you have to pull up user profiles, a uh, user profile, and there's tons on an order of five to six billion of users that we need to look up at. Third, we have pretty hard time limitations. So that one ad has to be returned ideally under a millisecond. Our media time is right now 900 microseconds. Um, so we need to serve these ads fast. And all that is relatively easy to achieve if you have a lot of money. But we don't. Uh, so all of that has to be done on a limited budget, where you can't really, I mean, there's some crazy cool software that you can buy you know, if you're big and you know, company that can spare. You can't do it. So basically, we can't do it because every single ad costs something to serve. And what we want to make sure is that at the end of the day, we're net positive. So the cost of serving ad is actually less than the amount of money that they can actually bring us. So. Um, this basically pushed us through the last five years to be on the edge of innovation where it's practical. So there, there are different edges of innovation, I believe. There is an edge that large companies are at, you know, they can mess with the craziest technologies, the most futuristic projects, and that usually costs a lot. And then there is the practical edge of technology where you're trying to adopt something that's becoming, uh, that's becoming maybe not as popular, it's not popular, it's becoming popular, and it's already affordable, and it's something that you can integrate into your stack and start using right now. So that's the edge that we were basically forced to live in just by the requirements of the stack and of the product that we're building. So uh, right now, you know, in terms of data processing, uh, first about 100, probably 200 terabytes a day, depends on who you ask. Uh, we do it out of nine data centers. So all this has to be done very fast and reasonably efficiently in terms of how much it costs to do. So I believe that these stats and these ideas put us in a very good position and give certain legitimacy to this talk because we process a lot of data, so we kind of have to catch on some trends of how data is processed. So, you know, it started five years ago, and five years ago, you know, joined an organization. Back then, we processed about 10 ad requests a day, and the median latency was about 100 uh, milliseconds, and there was one data center, which was also my laptop. So 
that was sort of where we started. And when it, we came into this, when I came into this, I had a very different ideas of what is uh, expensive and what is cheap and what we can use and what we can't use. So I always thought that RAM is an extremely expensive and a scarce resource. So basically, you know, if you have an application and you want to create a 10 megabyte cache, that was what, quite a bit, 100 megabyte cache, that was really scary. Because, you know, who knows what, you know, are we going to get out of RAM? Are we going to get page faults all the time? You don't know. I always thought that only hard drives, you know, the old with the spinners can store large amounts of data. So if you want to keep, you know, 10 gigabytes somewhere, the only place for it would be to put it in a hard drive and access it later. Of course, that comes at a price of slow access. So, you know, if you want to read that large file that you store from hard drive, you have to come up with some sort of maybe a queue or a separate thread or, you know, do some crazy asynchronous thing. So that was my uh, concept that, this is a concept that I was kind of taught in school and that I used in my day-to-day -day practice and when making decisions. So as the company grew and as we had to reduce our latencies, process more data, store more data, and also as the industry, the, namely the SSD industry, and uh, the cost of RAM kind of reduced and became more available, things became different and things started to change. So, and that's overly dramatic because it's all like a natural progression really. Uh, so what we found right now is of you know, 2016 and what we were able to leverage and we leverage on every, in every single server every single day. So, we found that RAM is actually not as expensive as it used to be. And you know, having a server with 128 gigabytes of RAM, it's a very legitimate thing. Uh, 256, that's a very legitimate thing. Now, there is an edge of innovation. I was looking up the spec last night, and uh, you can get a server with a terabyte of RAM, but it costs eight times the server with a quarter terabyte. So, you know, the ratio doesn't make sense to go that far yet, but what it means is there's a very strong trend towards having RAM being more abundant and cheaper. So another thing that changed, another thing that I, I can't uh, you know, keep repeating it and I can't highlight it enough, storage has changed. So from the big and relatively slow hard drives, you know, there are SSDs that used to be pretty expensive and now they're affordable. You can actually stick an SSD into your server and get a significant uh, performance improvement just by swapping hardware. So even though they are somewhat limited in space, I mean, again, when I say limited in space, I don't mean that, you know, you, for you know, for crazy amount of money, you can get very large drives. But for practical costs, they are somewhat limited. However, what conceptually changed and what changed my perspective to, you know, building system is that now we have this, basically large drives that are, relatively large drives that are fast and that allow random access. And that's obviously very different from hard drives and you know, we know tons of products that use the fact that you know, sequential access is faster on hard drives. And the fact that on solid state drives, uh, you can have random access, you can pull any file that you like. This, I think, changes the paradigm and this changes how you interact with your, how your product interacts with the file system, at least a little bit. So this is the state that we're in right now. And this, I think, can draw the following trend. So the trend is, and kind of the reason why I like this slide is because it shows the trend, and the most important thing to me is you can kind of see, and these are, like, uh, these are average, reasonably priced uh, hard drives, SSDs, and RAM. So we're not talking about you know, antique stuff, we're not talking about crazy future stuff, we're talking about market average, something you can go and get. So basically the thing to notice on this slide, other than, it's a very interesting choice of cars, but uh, other than the cars, the interesting thing is access times on top, right? So it takes 20 milliseconds to read one megabyte, uh, one millisecond to read one megabyte, and about 100 nanoseconds for RAM, right? So you see that this, is, this curve is sort of exponential. So the read times are dropping significantly. However, the available volumes are somewhat linear, so not, not entirely, especially for the last half, but you can see that the differences between read times are significantly more than the differences between available 
volumes. So this is another sort of precursor that leads me to believe that as uh, the industry develops, what we'd see is RAM is gonna get bigger, RAM hopefully is gonna retain its access time, and it's gonna be more affordable to have large applications, and like really large applications, like you know terabytes of data large, basically fully reside in RAM, because that's the trend that we're seeing. And this is sort of the big claim that I'd like to make. And, you know, kind of, I think we're what, we're about, uh, about 15 minutes into the thing. So that's my point. And that's the future of data storage. Everything will be in RAM. And that's one thing I'd like you to get out of this. You know, you're gonna you know, go and like, have your lunch and whatnot. Uh, and you'll probably forget everything else that I'm gonna say. But the thing that I'd like you to remember is that the future of data storage is RAM well, at least from the perspective of like one relatively small advertising company. So that's the thing that I, that's the point of this talk and that's what I'd like to illustrate in, in a few examples. So, um, you know, one of the things that we do at Uploving, right, is we need to serve ad. So to serve an ad, you have to look up tons of data and uh, and this is the metaphor that I'm going to be using, the metaphor, you know, electric car is like full RAM. I'm going to show you a Toyota Prius of, uh, uh, of data storage, and then I'm going to show you an uh, Alfa Romeo in a drag race with an Alfa Romeo being towed by a Tesla. I know it sounds confusing, it actually is confusing, but it's a pretty cool concept, because Tesla ultimately wins. So my goal is to show how strong the pull towards RAM-only solutions is, and how practical you can get if you leverage this sort of way of thinking. How do you put stuff in RAM? So one of the things that we, ha we have to do to serve an ad is we have to look up tons of advertisements. I think we have about a million of different advertisements, and you need to figure out, out of the million, okay, so for this particular user, what ads are eligible? Uh, what ads, um, you know, this particular user may be interested in what would he find engaging? Basically, there is a little model, you need to pull coefficients from the model. Basically, there is a whole bunch of things that you need to read in order to serve the best available ad, right? And to read that, we went through several different databases. We were reading it at some point from Redis, at, uh, from Memcache, it wasn't slow, it wasn't fast enough. We moved to Couchbase, it wasn't fast enough. We tried Redis, it wasn't fast enough. Uh, somewhere in there, there was Cassandra, and that was, its own little thing. Uh, but at the end of the day, we decided, you know what? Here's where it's going. We've got to write our own caching solution, and it's got to all live in RAM. So we wrote a super simple cache. I mean, how do caches work? Caches are, you know, have uh, diff different implementations. The implementations we went for is, you know, you have a fairly large key space, and you have a data space. So basically, let's say you want to look up a string. So what do you do? You take a string, you hash it, you get some you know, number, right? Then you have this key space, which is effectively just a 1.6 gigabytes, you know, very, very large array. Then you look in the array at that offset. Uh, the offset is the number that you got from your hashing. And that offset contains a pointer to your data space where the actual value is. It is a very simple implementation. And it's an extremely inefficient implementation of cache. I mean, I'm sure that, uh, if, if you look at databases especially, that much more sophisticated ways to store this sort of key value data in an efficient manner. Now, the thing that we were doing, uh, the thing that we were leveraging is that RAM is cheap. We don't care if it takes a lot of RAM. We don't care if it takes, you know, this particular one is at gigabytes, right? But it can grow to 100 gigabytes for all we care about because even though it's inefficient, RAM is cheap. And we can live with this sort of inefficiency, uh, memory-wise inefficiency, but relative simplicity in terms of implementation. And, you know, when we develop that thing, basically the way it works is, you know, this eight gigabytes lives in memory, right? And then you have a whole bunch of process servers that run on the same box. They basically M map uh, the shared memory into their own process space and use it as if it's their own memory. So you have a whole bunch of processes. They share this, this large cache and everything's great. Um, now, one of the easy things that we, one of the limitations that we had, I guess not limitations, 
one of the good things that we had is this memory uh, can be updated once in a while due to our use case. So you don't have to update it dynamically. You can update every five minutes. So effectively, for all of the edge processes, this is a read-only memory. This helps tremendously because you don't need to deal with locking. You don't need to deal with synchronization. So that's what makes it feasible to implement this cache. I think this cache was implemented by a team of one people. So uh, that made it feasible to implement it this way. Now, since it's read-only, it was super easy not to use up the edge server's memory or CPU for anything else. What we opted out to do is we basically said, you know what? So there's this eight gigabytes of stuff, right? So let's just have one server that's you know, the cache creator, and it basically creates a blob of eight gigabytes worth of bytes you know, on one box. Then we ship it out to all of our nine data centers to what's called middle masters, and then within the data center, we use torrents to distribute that one blob to every single server. So once that blob is distributed and the server has a, a full, full collection of those, by, uh, of those bytes, it pretty much swaps what it, has in, what it has in memory right now with the newly distributed, newly received file. And that's pretty much it, right? So this creates a very powerful, very fast um, caching solution that, I mean, the downside, of course, is it's not live. It has you know, five to 10 minutes delay, and you have to account for latency of distribution. But if your use case allows for it, you can get some very reasonable performance timings. Like you know, to read a key, you know, it's actually not as bad as we initially thought. Basically, what we, thought, uh, what we saw is that most of our, I mean, the way advertising world works, apparently the way the world of mobile application works is people generally use two, three big apps all the time, right? So you have this very, very, very uh, big CAD. So basically, most of the volume is generated from a very narrow set of users, very narrow set of applications. And what's great about you know, the model that we kind of didn't foresee but that worked is most of our frequent keys actually end up on L4 CPU cache. And probably, you know, as I said, that this talk is not about the uh, distant future of computing, and probably if it was about distant future of computing, I would have made a claim that everything is going to live in the CPU cache at some point. We're not that crazy, and we're not there yet, and it's not feasible, I think, right now to talk about it. But what we found is majority of keys are actually looked up from the CPU cache, then some fail back to RAM. So that's, that's the benefit. I mean, and that's the solution that we kind of developed, and it fully leaves in RAM. And right now, it's pretty small, but I feel confident that as you know, the business grows and as demands grow, we will be able to just add more and more keys because, again, RAM is not that, uh, is not that crazy. So another solution that I want to talk to you about is an Aerospike database. And to me, you know, this, this is the, uh, what it's called, Toyota Prius of databases, right? So it basically combines an approach of RAM only and hard drive only databases. So what it does, I mean, if you look at it from a high level, you know, it looks like a very, very standard key value data store. You know, you have a cluster of nodes, and your application connects to that cluster. And it's pretty simple if you think about it. So what Aerospike promises is they promise very fast read and write times. And they're actually one of the few databases that we found that's actually able to deliver on that promise. Uh, they also um, promise that their transactional, I think, they, they, they promise full ACID, which is pretty cool, and they don't deliver on that promise. Uh, but they deliver good enough, so we'll let it pass. And uh, finally, they, they promise that they can store terabytes and terabytes of data, and they do deliver on that promise. So, you know, we use this database to store our, you know, four or five billion user profiles, which is quite a bit of data distributed across a bunch of nodes, it actually still ends up being a very feasible system. So with Aerospike, basically you're able to choose uh, and you're able to pick where would you like your data to be. So they give you two namespaces. And they give you a RAM namespace and they can say, you know what, in this namespace if you want something fast uh, and small, you know, go ahead and use that. And then they have the data kind of namespace which is just a different place that you can put your data, and uh, this will live on disks. And I think 
Aerospec actually supports all sort of drives, and uh, you know, they I think they can even run on hard drive like VHDs. Uh, I'm not sure about that. So I know that though they're very specific about the models of SSDs. So when you work, I mean, we work very closely with them because we are looking for very low latencies, and they actually give you like a list of models of SSDs that they think are kosher and you know, the SSDs that everyone should be using. And they're, they actually have a team that optimizes their access for that specific drive, for that specific, uh, I, I mean, they do crazy things. So. so yeah, but this is a very good example of a hybrid solution where depending on your implementation, you can pick and choose where your data should be. Like for example, what we have is you know, our key space, like every single, every user is keyed by a key, right? Um, every single key, it lives in RAM, so if we get a request for a user that we don't know, it's super fast to fail because you know it's a RAM lookup. If we get a key for a user that we do know, it's very easy um, for us to go from the key to the data namespace from where we get the actual user profile. And I should say, I mean, if I can kind of see the numbers here, it's about a 1.6 terabytes uh, per node of the data names of of the data namespace about. 150 gigabytes lives in RAM. So this database is able to pack uh, pretty much every single person in the world in, in one cluster. So that's very nice. While doing that, they ha maintain a, yes? When you said bridging, what, what did you mean bridging from what to what? Bridging from RAM to SSDs. So the question was, when I said bridging, bridging from what to what? So to me, this is an example of a product that can kind of operate in both worlds, and you as a developer have a choice. You know, you're either using some kind of SSD or you use RAM. Does it kind of make sense? Yeah, so, um, yes, yeah, so while doing that, uh, it actually has a very, lim a very reasonable, uh, a very reasonable times to read. So, you know, about 250, uh, microseconds for an in-memory read, and then about a one millisecond read if you need to go to SSD and pull the actual user profile. Now, this is another kind of interesting point that I wanted to make, and that's another reason why you know, you'd wanna always be looking for, if you're interested in efficiency, you'll always be looking in new interfaces and new technologies that are out there, because we found that uh, some of the newer SSDs basically use a, a different interface, it's called NVMe interface, and that's pretty much a different way to talk to your hard drive. It's more parallel, it's, uh, it's quite a bit faster. So just by switching to that NVMe interface to talk to an SSD drive, just by doing that, you can get uh, you know, about half in benefit in the read times. So yes, you need to have, like it's a little, you know, some SSD support it, some don't, you need to have your operations team actually do something and pay some money, but for the benefits are really, really high. So basically, when we do, when we serve our request, the biggest time that's, that we spend is actually fetching that profile. So in that one millisecond, most of it is going to an NVMe air spike and get that user profile, and that's you know, 600 microseconds, which is quite a bit, but unfortunately we have to get the user profile. We, we, we couldn't figure out how to do it without how to serve relevant ads uh, without it. Still, what it shows you, and yeah, we have about five billion keys, so it's a reasonably, reasonably sized database. So what this shows is that even with this hybrid solution, if, even if you're you know, doing SSD reads, the reads are insanely fast. Um, also, with the database, since we didn't write it, and the team who wrote AirSpike was definitely more than one person, uh, it's transactional, so it's transactional and it supports rights. When I say transactional, there's actually, there's a very great study, I don't know if you guys know, I think his name is Apfer, A-P-H-Y-R, so he's probably really interesting database researcher, he wrote just Jepson and kind of a couple of other tools to investigate database uh, transactionality, and he ran it on Aerospike, and he basically proved with his results that it's not transactional, in reality, yes, maybe it's not, like it doesn't handle failure all that well. If the node goes down, it might not be as fast to bring it back up. However, in practical terms, when you don't care about the precise values, like for example, you know, if you have 
uh, $100 to spend, and if you spend instead of $100, you spend $100 and one cent, in the world of advertising, that's an acceptable margin of error. So this database is special as a transitional solution where you, know, you have reads, you have writes, you can store tons of keys, and you, know, you can still kind of move between SSDs and memory. It's still a very reasonable solution to go with. Uh, those are primary, so these five billion keys are basically primary keys to a blob of a user profile. So for each of these keys, there's about maybe two to three hundred kilobytes worth of user profile data. So. Mm -hmm. Sure. So we were using Couchbase. So we were using Couchbase about three to four years ago. So my comparison is not up to date. That's actually when we switched to AirSpike. So uh, when we did compare, we found that AirSpike first, since you can actually, like once you get at the hardware that it's like, that it likes, once you get at the right SSDs and once you put in the right, put in the right network configuration, it can deliver a much faster results under load. So these are the numbers where you have, well, again, it's four years ago. So these are the numbers that we saw uh, under you know, load of about 60 billion requests a day. So what does it make out to 250,000 a second? Uh, you know, I, I second this. I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, and look, so that was number one. And second, when we used Couchbase a while ago, our failures were like a disaster. So we had a couple node failures where you know the drive would get corrupt and whatnot, and basically it wasn't able to recover in time. Again, that was a little while back, so maybe it's fixed now. But um, yeah, that was that's how we experienced back then. Read. So when I talk about yeah, so when I talk about so all we care about is reads, right? Writes. There are some writes, but eh, who cares about those? Uh, it's reading, it's getting one key under load. So you have tons of servers that try to get this one key, they try to get the data. So we're looking for very fast reads when there is data. And what's more, what's also important, we're looking for very fast reads when the data isn't there. So that ideally would be even faster, but, so which, which happens to our spike. Okay, uh, I, I think you're first. Uh. Right. So how does so how how do we use the fact that it's random? No, NUMA. If you know about the NUMA standards, like you know, if you have multiple memory in the memory slot, or whatever the allocation of memory on one slot, you say oh, 9 to 50, right? Mm -hmm. So we haven't yet had to go that deep into the optimization, luckily. So again, I think that we will have to get there at some point, but not right now. What is that called, NUMA? N-U-M-A, non-uniform memory access. So for uh, memory, Oh yeah, so that's pretty good. So that's a good question. So this is uh, this is the round trip. So basically, the biggest problem with AeroSpike, and the reason why it's never going to be as good as uh, you know the in-memory solution, is this. So basically, it lives as its own cluster, right? So when you do a lookup, uh, you need to do, like there is an overhead because there is a network overhead, right? And we're trying to go with you know as good of network cards as we have then there is an overhead because once it hits the node, right, the keys are distributed across different uh, nodes of the cluster. So if you're lucky and if you hit the node um, that has the key that you're looking for, then it's gonna be a little faster. But in reality, it needs to, actually don't remember how exactly it does, if it does the redirect on the server or on the client, but it needs, there is an overhead because you know, it distributes all that data across the cluster. So that's where the extra 
things come, uh, what's, that's where the extra latency comes from. Now, if only we could have everything live on one box in RAM, if only we could take that whatever 1.2 terabytes and just stick it in RAM, we would see like a new magnitude of latencies as we do see on our sort of RAM only in-house solution. But again, as I said, we're talking about practical future. So putting this stuff, uh, you know, taking the entire, you know, two terabytes of user profiles and just putting it on memory in every server, it's not yet practical. However, the point of this talk is that I believe that it will be practical, give it two, three years. D does it kind of answer your question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's actually a really good question. The question is, you know, since you have the users, do you, can you cache something on your own local server, right, and thus get better memory? So what we found, so we actually tried that. We, we tried exactly that. Our idea was, you know what, you have so many users, but we're sure that there are few users who just keep, you know, keep coming and repeating and getting these ads over and over and over again. So how about we just take their profiles and put them in local memory and we're going to have a nice cache and... Uh, you know, that's going to be that. So we tried that. And maybe there are domains for which this approach works. What we found in our domain is that it actually doesn't work. So what we found that first, there's quite a bit of people, there's a lot of people who get ads at the same time. So there's not a very definite, um, like small group that's, you know, what's it called, addicts, I guess. We found that. We also found that they keep, for some reason, people keep round robining uh, among different data centers in the United States. So what we found is a user could be hitting one data center, like an attic user could be hitting one data center just for a few times and then switch to another and then keep flopping. So again, if there was more memory, if it was cheaper, that would be the way to go. Right now, I don't think it matched, it, it met that practical threshold, at least in our industry, of course for other industries and for other use cases, you know, sort of your mileage may vary. Does it, does it sort of answer the follow-up question? That's a good question, I actually didn't know. So what we found, so this is kind of jumps into a slightly different talk. So what we found is how, do, how does the advising work, right? So you have your phone, the user makes a request, right, to, you know, ads.apploving.com, and that's get routed to you know, one of the data centers that we have, right? So what we found is we have a couple of data centers on the East Coast, a couple on the West Coast, and we found that there's quite a bit of people who jump between the two. Why exactly that happens? We, we're working with a few providers to actually make sure that there's a certain tying users to a data center, but why that happens, I don't know yet. Mm -hmm. and, and by, by distance or by traffic, and it, it might be, yep. if it's between an AWS, maybe that service is distributing to different locations that you don't want it to. Right. So again, I want to keep sort of a little bit away from it. It's actually a very interesting, like the network setup and like how do you fight DDoS attacks and how do you like deal with users that are like all over the place. It's a very different question. We have few approaches. It's not the scope of this talk. So another thing might yeah. be. Could be, could be, but anyway, I want to. I wanted to ask you the two things that you said: the cash solution and the cost solution. Mm -hmm. So this is talking about the cash solution. Yes. And that means just within within the RAM itself. Yep. And the other one, the aerospace cost solution, the aerospace cost for cluster applications. Yes. Uh, Airspike is a third-party tool. It was developed by a team of very smart people, and uh, Applaving Cache is something proprietary to our thing. It's something that we developed by a team of one people. So, do you guys have any questions so far? Because I have one more, like mildly entertaining slide. Um, yes. Yeah, so, this is a mildly entertaining slide, and it's a little blurry, but. On this slide, there's an Alfa Romeo 4C you know, in that lane, and there's a Tesla pulling in another Alfa Romeo 4C 
in this lane and they drag raced and Tesla won. And you know, like th that one has more, I think it has more brake horsepower than like a Lamborghini Diablo, which is insane, but, uh, and, and still Tesla won. So this is an illustration of another thing that we found at Uploving. So Vertica is a very old school analytical database. So it was, um, it was, it's like a distrib, it's like MySQL on, on steroids, right? It takes data, it distributes it across a big cluster. I think, you know, uh, when you go to Vertica meetups, you hear people like running 100, 200 node clusters uh, with that software. It's really designed, it's a columnar database, so it really has been designed for, you know, your good old hard drives, for sequential reads. You know, it's the most classic, I think, um, it's the most classic database where you have a server, you have a big node, every node, I mean, the idea is that every node is relatively slow, the disk access is relatively slow, but you have a lot of node, data is distributed, so your sort of computation, the query execution is done in parallel across multiple nodes, then they all, um, you know, send the data into one spot, the data is merged and returned to you, and the cool thing about Vertica is that it has SQL interface, so it's actually, I think it's built on PostgreSQL, but, you know, it's, it's really nice, because, you know, as you transition from MySQL to something different, it's a very somewhat seamless transition. So it's a very, it's a very old school setup. And what we found is, you know, we're kind of trying to think about how to make our queries faster, how to make the UI faster, and what can we do to kind of take that setup and to, you know, put it all in RAM. And there were a couple different ideas, and one of the ideas well, was, well, let's just like mount a RAM drive and like see if it's gonna work there. And that didn't work very well, but what we ended up doing, and to me, this is, this is just an example of how to put more stuff in RAM, right? That's the point of the talk. What we ended up doing is we ended up trimming our data to the point where it could, for a given node, fit in RAM. So we have about uh, 200 gigabytes of data. And what we found was that effectively, after running for a little bit, most of the data that the database is using was just in the disk cache in RAM, which was really great, because of course the called installation of the, like the called restart and the called uh, version of the database would be miserably slow. And when I say miserably slow, we're talking about five seconds per query. Um, and then when, when it became hot and when most of the keys and most of the column of files were actually loaded, it suddenly got to like one, two seconds per query, which was great. And I mean, kind of was great because then the problem that we started having is uh, since it was so much faster, a lot of business users were thinking that they're hitting cache all the time and they didn't see the latest data. And they're like, oh, it's so fast, it's gonna refresh and the numbers are gonna change. But no, so it was actually hitting the database, it was hitting the um, data source. So this was, and you know, our job right now is basically to figure out a balance between the cluster size and the data size to make sure that whenever the data is pushed to a given node of the cluster, it all can fit in, in RAM of a disk cache. And that is, um, and that's something that I think is a good indication of this strong pull towards RAM being applied to an older technology. So yeah, so now we basically have about a second average query time. The database holds, and it's a little hard to um, quantify, it holds about 4.2 billion rows. So it's basically all of the statistical information, like we need to show to our partners how many ads they've shown, how much money uh, we owe them, or they owe us, or whatnot. And we made it, I mean, it's an old school database. It has true ACID. It's actually, this is where every cent discrepancy, I think we, don't, we can't really have. So it's fully transactional, and you know, we have our stats updating every five minutes, so almost live. So the reason why I brought this example is, uh, I just wanted to share, I thought it's a very curious merger of this sort of a product that was really designed for a different world and how it can work in this sort of newer world of RAM only stuff without much effort on engineering part, which is my favorite. So anyway, in conclusion, you know, we talked about, you know, talked about RAM only solutions. We talked about this sort of somewhat hybrid approach of Aerospike, we talked about you know, this uh, solution of an old product trying to run, run on the new, uh, 
on the new uh, data storage model. You know, in conclusion, what I'd like to encourage you to do with another meme is think big. So what I, what I, mean, to set, what I mean to say by this is, you know, when you design your next application, when you venture and go and you do your next startup, ask, ask yourself, you know, can you take, what, what can you take advantage from the future? Can you take advantage of bigger RAM? Can you take advantage of bigger SSDs? The question that I, that's my favorite, and I ask myself when we launch any new uh, piece of our architecture, I ask myself, so, okay, so we designed this, so what if tomorrow, um, you know, RAM is 100%, 100 times cheaper and 100 times larger? Would my design be compatible with that, that new world? And that's really what I'd like to uh, finish up with today. I'd like you, you know, you came here and you found this place and, you know, you're probably pretty hungry at this point and you're probably asking the question, what's in this talk for me? And what I'd like to, what I'd like you to leave with is this question. How do I make my architecture and how do I make my products compatible with the future. So, on this note, uh, yeah, on this, and yes, the, the, sorry, I should probably, in the answer to this question, I put everything in RAM, <laughs> right? So, on this note, I'd like to conclude, and uh, if you have any questions, I'd be, uh, I'd be very happy to answer. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, I'm curious how much effect the turnaround time or the, you know, the, the access time was if you plan this long term meeting. So, a lot. So, as I think that this is mostly relevant with our, so the question is, you know, what if, so this is bad, this access is bad when you go locally, right? It adds you know, several hundred microseconds to your processing. What if it goes across country? If it grows across country, it's a disaster. So basically, it's a disaster. I mean, again, in our business of low margins, when we have a, that's why we have two data centers on one end and two data centers on the other end of the United States, because if, uh, if we need to point servers in one data center to a user database in the other data center, it adds 300, 400 milliseconds to the response time. And at that point, we're like better off not serving ads at all. Because we're gonna serve like complete junk and we're just you know, wasting everyone's money, we're creating bad experience for the user. So that's why we make sure that on every coast we have two data centers so that if one data center fails, we can fail over. It'll add about, on the same coast, it'll add about maybe 20, 30 milliseconds of latency, which is not ideal, but it's tolerable. So people will cringe, but they won't cry. Which is good, good enough. Yes. Um, what do you mean comparable to that of like candy or tortilla? Or like, are you talking about the mm -hmm. like so, yeah. Right. So, what gives me confidence that the trend will continue um, is just the fact that we observed that trend before with hard drives, we observed that trend before with. SSDs, where you know initially they were really small and they were uh, they were really um, expensive, right? And also they had SSDs that initially even now they have limitations of number of writes. So you know if you write to SSDs too many times, at some point it'll say, you know what, I'm not going to accept these writes anymore. So bye bye. Uh, used to be worse. Now it's a little better. Still kind of a problem. But uh, so the reason why I believe that this trend will continue is because I saw it happening with other, pro well, I read about it happening with other products. I saw it happen with SSDs. So uh, it's very reasonable to believe that the same thing is going to happen to RAM because we see it becoming cheaper and cheaper and we see servers that I think, you know, yesterday I was doing some research and I saw a server that can accept three terabytes of RAM, which is insanely cool, but very expensive and prohibitively for practical purposes. So, you know, it's a prediction. Maybe I'm completely wrong but everything points in that direction. It matches up with the past, and also it doesn't seem like a revolutionary idea, which is probably means that it's right. And the uh, follow-up question is, like, in your role, as a subject expert, you have no, like, any clinical significance, like, 
Right, so is there a Moore's law? Is there a limit on memory? It's a good question. Probably yes, there is, right? Because the limitations are, you know, physics and, you know, using this technology, there's a boundary that you hit and you can't go beyond because that's the way the world works. It sucks, but it's true. Uh, for memory, I think, yes, there is this limitation. I think right now we're pretty far away from it and we're far enough not to care about it. So it's basically a problem for, you know, future, future Basel to solve and I don't care about that guy. Uh, so, uh, yeah, so the upper bound, we've, we saw that the upper bound for latency is basically 100 milliseconds. So everyone else in the market, all the other ad companies, they strive for 100 milliseconds response, time, response times with networking, with processing, all in all. So usually when you're integrating with a partner, again, it's only true for advertising industry. Other industry has other standards, so I'm just talking about what I know. But when you're integrating with an, another partner, usually they expect about, like they give you a 130 second, uh, millisecond timeout. So we're trying to basically, uh, we're trying to basically limit processing to about you know, a millisecond and then depending on where the partner is, the rest is just networking. Ah, yes, yes, so that's an excellent question. So, yeah, the question is, so if, you know, if an SSD gives you um, millisecond latency, why even use like this shenanigans with cache? And so this is time per read. So it takes a millisecond to read one key from SSD. Now, when we serve an ad request, we need to read about three to 4,000 keys uh, to, you know, to create our model, to run it, to see what ads are available, to see like, what, how ads are targeted. So this one read is 100% tolerable for this one big thing, which is a user profile, totally cool. But when you have to, uh, when you have to do, you know, thousands of those reads, that millisecond basically, you know, is, is way too slow. So I'm sorry, I should have probably been more clear about it during during the presentation. Does it does it answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you still have a question? Yeah. So it's part of that. So what we did is we did, we used a, at some point, we used a RAID array, I think it was a hard drive RAID array, and you can plug in an SSD into it to use it as a, effectively a cache. So that was the extent of this sort of fusion stuff that we did. But ultimately, we kind of saw those as hybrid solutions and said, you know what, let's just bank it all on going 100% RAM. So we didn't do as much diligence on fusion or other products that kind of try to beef up hard drives, um, we didn't do a lot of that. Kind of the idea was, you know what? Let's just let's just move, put all of our, what's it called? Put all of our dice on RAM. Put, you know what I'm saying? Chips, chips. Put all our chips on RAM. Ah, I see. So no, we haven't looked. We haven't looked into that. So. All right. Second question. You mentioned this one time. You said kind of like the future. Future is all the data will be the CPU cache. How long do you think it'll be till that? <laughs> That's. Uh, you know what? This is a question I really can't answer. I. It would be speculation. It would be wild speculation because of the cost, because of the uh, the uh, like. What are the limitations of the silicone? I, that's, that's why 
in the very beginning of the talk, I said that we're talking about practical future. To me, this is not a practical future at this point. So speculating about that would be, you know, like, you know, I, I don't want to give, I mean, I, I don't want to give an answer because it would be wild speculation. But I do, yeah, I don't think it's there yet. The trend shows that it might get there, and that was my point. So that'd be a logical thing. And have you done anything with, with like big data with Hadoop, or is this all just in like, like simple optics storage? So actually, this is initially when I was preparing this uh, presentation last night, I actually had four examples. So the fourth example was Spark. And this, the example of Spark was how can you leverage uh, this sort of new model of RAM, like storing things in RAM or using it from RAM to process big data and to kind of transform your MapReduce to, to this new way. But I thought, I mean, I was actually running out of time when I was telling it to my wife. She was getting pretty bored. So I was like, you know what? I need to get one of those examples out. And Spark was the one. So yeah, so we actually do run, we run two clusters. Each cluster is about 1.5 petabytes. Uh, and that's, that's where we do most of processing and analysis on the data. And again, we're banking on the same thing. We're trying to design our clusters in our data store in a way where we can basically load the most recent data in RAM, right? And all of the analysis runs, uh, runs with that data. So yes, so Hadoop, I believe, is great technology. I think it's a little bit, uh, we're not using it as much, not at all. We're using Spark for big data analysis, yeah. Yeah, because it basically banks on the same thing we bank on as a company, which is in memory, uh, is big, abundant, cheap, and everything should be there. So we're using Spark. Yes? So before you mentioned that uh, Memcache is not, you can't Memcache to the store, mm -hmm. it's not possible. Yep. From my understanding of the Memcache tries to store everything in memory, too. Mm -hmm. Yes, I actually have a guess why. Um, and it's a guess. So the, the, thing, the thing that's great about the cache that we've built is it leverages one of the, one of the uh, freedoms that we can have, and that freedom is read onlyness And by dealing with read onlyness we don't need to deal with any sort of synchronization. We don't need to deal with any sort of blocking reads, uh, sorry, blocking writes. We don't need to care about any of that stuff. And that's really awesome. And memcached, I mean, they're not a specialized cache. They're a general purpose cache, which is great for general purpose. However, you know, everything comes at a price. And the price of this sort of, you know, you can read there, you can write from there, you can expire keys, the price is extra latency. So that's why, you, and of course, if, you, if it's not a part of what you need to do, you can cut it out and be faster. So uh, that's, I mean, I, I didn't, I didn't like run flame graphs on Memcache, uh, but this would be my guess just conceptually because they they solve a more generic use case than we solve a more specific use case. Does it make sense? Yeah, yeah. So just, just to clarify, when you did use Memcache, were you doing it locally? Because Memcache was running locally. Oh, that was a story. So initially it was running remotely, then okay. we, we pulled it to like closer to the servers, okay. then our last iteration was it was running locally on a port, then we made it run locally connected to it through a Unix socket, and then we went, you know what, that's not good enough. So, yes, we, we, tried, we tried it all. Right. Any other questions, comments, concerns? Okay, uh, yeah. So. There are two reasons why, so there's a big reason why I give this presentation and the practical reason. The big reason I love Silicon Valley Code Camp and I've been here many times as, a, as an attendee and I feel like, you know, when I have an interesting idea to share, it's my turn to share it. And second, the practical is I believe, and I believe that my perspective or what's slow, what's fast, what's abundant, what's cheap, was outdated, you know, only a few years ago. And the reason for me to give this presentation is because I believe that due to what we've done at Uplaving, we are able to be on this edge of technology. And if I'm able to share our perspective with any of you guys, and you know, you come back and you make a decision that will be more future-oriented, 
at least as we believe in it, maybe it will make someone else's system a little better, scale a little cheaper, and ultimately make the world a little faster and a little more in memory. So does it kind of answer your question? Uh, yeah, I'll, I think that there is like a website that you, like from the Silicon Code Camp website, I think you, you post them to. Yeah, yeah, I'll post them, like I'll send it to the organizers and you can download from there. All right, any other questions? No? All right, well, thank you so much for coming. <laughs>